Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever, stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To join me, go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now and sign up for our free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter, where I share how to reduce risk and create, grow, and protect your wealth. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest David Siegel. David, are you ready to rejoin the mission? Let's do it. <laughs> well, I want to introduce you to the audience, and for those long-term listeners, you will recognize David. He was episode 98. That was back in 2019, where he talked about startups should start with selling. And that's a little bit about bootstrapping versus uh, raising funds and selling and all of that. It was a great conversation. Uh, and uh, let me just introduce you to David. For those that have not met him, David Siegel is an entrepreneur who has started more than a dozen companies. He has written five books on technology and business, has given more than 200 professional speeches around the world, and was once a candidate to be the dean of Stanford Business School. He is a fintech leader, a leader of the open metaverse movement, a business strategy coach, and an advocate for the scientific method. Hmm. He writes and makes videos about climate change at www.climatecurious.com. David, tell, take a minute and tell us about the unique value that you're bringing to this world critical thinking right i mean it's hard you know i've i've been studying bayesian reasoning and critical thinking for 10 years i would say before that when i was in my 40s i was a total idiot um i had some good successes but i didn't understand the role of luck in business and cause and effect is too easy for people to put together in their minds to build a mental model that is wrong Right. And that's why you want to study failure, which which, you yeah. know, thankfully, you no know, few smart people do, because that's where you that's where the learning is. It's not in success. You know, don't don't take business advice from Elon Musk. Um, he's been hit really hard by the money truck too many mm. times. <clears throat> mm. Right. So those of us who've been in the trenches and seen a lot of things not work, uh, <clears throat> you know, we we don't we want to reduce risk at the same time. You want to have an impact. Right. Yeah. And so uh, I, I have been on this thing for climate since 1988. I wrote my first book on climate in 1991. So I'm not one of these. Everybody's an instantly a climate expert thing. I've been doing it for more than 30 years. Uh, and I believe, like Al Gore, that CO2 was bad and CO2 was causing climate change and, uh, you know, birds to fly backwards and hurricanes to turn the wrong way and all that stuff. And and uh, and then I really dug into it in 2015 and spent practically a full year doing nothing but climate research and realized that if you if you study climate for 10 hours or 20 hours, you're just going to get the standard line. But the deeper you go, the worse it gets. And the more the data is doctored, the more the the um, uh, uh, journals are in on the game, they are biased and the more the, the money and mm. the the, the institutions and the and the educational institutions. I've had a PhD student email me and tell, to tell me he got uh, let go from a climate PhD program because he was asking too many questions. Um, it has become a religion. Mm. And so I present the data so people can make up their own mind because it's hard. Right. And interpreting data, there's a lot of bad data out there. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of people trying to convince you that the earth is that the world is ending. You know, stubbornly, uh, despite the headlines, the world global average temperature doesn't continue to go up much at all. And uh, the money is in the scare. The money is in the sounding the alarm. And it's now a $2 trillion industry. This it seems like it's almost unstoppable at this point. I mean, who would true. not, you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can hear people talk about um, climate change is the cause of almost everything. everything. And right. so um, it's, and then if you think about young people and you hear that every single day, I mean, how yeah. would you have either the mental 
capacity or the emotional or mental strength to overcome yeah. that. It seems like it would be very difficult at this point. And it's hardcore dogma. It's in all the textbooks. The teachers have no idea. They just teach what's in the textbooks. Plenty of scientists don't understand, you know, thermal equilibrium and meridional heat uh, uh, distribution. You know, it's a there's a lot of parts to it. Mm. And if you just look from a kind of a bird's eye view, you'll say, Oh, well, CO2 is up and temperatures are up, I guess, a bit. So, okay, so I guess one must cause the other. But but as we know, causation is hard. Causality is very difficult. Mm. But now, as you, the reason we're talking today, Andrew, is that it has metastasized into this global ESG movement that has been foist on us by the World Economic Forum and the UN. I'm okay, not so a conservative. Okay, let's define what is ESG, just for the listeners right, that don't right. know. I want to just quickly disclaim, I'm not a conservative, I'm not a liberal. I believe you should take every issue at its face value and, and understand each issue, each vaccine, each tornado, you know, each each event, everything has to have be on its own merits and not this kind of overall overarching cause and effect. So, mm. so <clears throat> ESG has been going on for 20 years now. It's pretty much a UN program that's strongly endorsed by the World Economic Forum, which is happening right now in Davos. And it stands for Environment, Social Justice, and Governance, ESG. It's got a bunch of predecessors, all of which are all basically the same people who've been making money, scaring people for the last 30 years because they've they found that it works. And mm -hmm. so this this, the point of ESG is to give every, and this is amazing, every company a score, especially every public company, a very detailed scorecard. It's, it's worse than a financial audit of their carbon footprint, of their <clears throat> use of water or energy or materials or, or uh, pollution and stuff. So, so there are some good problems there to dig into. But everything is so highly rigorously, well, rigorous is wrong. Uh, uh, I would call it rigorous nonsense, sco scored so that you come out with a single score. And then you're, you know, you get let in and out of various indexes based on that score. And these indexes are run by giant uh, <clears throat> asset managers like BlackRock and State Street and many others, and they, they put you on a list according to your score. And the score also includes a bunch of fake virtue signaling for diversity. And it's really fake diversity. You have to have a diversity officer now, and you have to tick a lot of boxes and show that you've got the diverse board and diverse uh, executive team. And diverse. it doesn't mean that you're any company is any good at what it does. It means that you're signaling to the market that you're obeying these edicts. And then the last one is governance. And do you have a bunch of checks and balances and control of control and of you know what if and risk management? That honestly, we had a lot of that before the great recession in 2020, 20, 2008, 2009, and it all imploded um, because it people don't know much about risk management. I'm sure you've read mm. The Failure of Risk Management by Doug Hubbard. Yep, yep. Yeah, so, so he just shows the nuts and bolts of it's just all signaling and it's not really people understanding what they're doing. And one right? question it's, is, can you, um, would you, would it make sense to separate uh, the E and the S from the G or is there, because um, if I look at the governance concept, you know, I can understand that as an individual investor in a company, I want to know that there's some structures in place that are going to prevent the majority shareholders taking advantage of me. And I presume sure. that's what the original intent of governance was from, you know, I went back and looked at kind of when did governance really start to come around? I can see like the mid seventies was the beginning of, of a lot of governance stuff, but um, what is your perception on governance relative to the E and the S aspect? 
I'm saying there are problems here for sure. Um, I'm saying the cure is worse than the disease. Mm. So the way to do it is not to have Deloitte give your company a score. Um, Deloitte was also the lawyer for Enron or the uh, consulting company for Enron. Uh, all these guys are the same people who played a big role in the 2008 group financial crisis. They are all on board for the money. Uh, they, there's no critical thinking. In fact, a peer reviewed study came out a couple months ago showing that, that these scores are, ESG scores are so arbitrary that they're pretty much the main person who's doing the scores concept of overall concept of the company and just turned into a score. Mm. Um, they're not, there's no requirements really. It's just, it's this very, uh, uh, um, not non-rigorous. It's not a scorecard. It's, it's not objective at all. Um, and it's, and it really comes down to, do we think these are good guys and we're going to, we're going to charge them a bunch for the rating. So there's a lot of conflict of interest, right? And, and the government's thing just like the environment, just like social, it's important. It's just we're mm. doing it the wrong way, right? And by so pulling it down into a score, people get people get sorted according to the score, and that's very bad. Okay, so let's uh, first of all, if you can find that research, I'll I'll include that one in the show notes so that people can look it's at on it. my website. Yep. Okay. It's on. I've got a blog. I have yep. a blog on the website. Yep. And uh, there's a peer reviewed paper there mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. Harvard. We'll go through that. that I'll, I'll include that on the on the uh, on the show please. notes. Now let's um, yeah. let's talk about what what is the problem that ESG. You know, let, let's just step back because yeah, the world's got a lot of problems. Yeah, and we right. want to try to solve them, and this is one of the reasons why I think people feel like I've got to join ESG because otherwise I'm not doing something to solve the problems right. that we face in this life in this world. So what are right. the problems that we are facing or that ESG type of thing is trying to solve? So there's a, there's a wide range. Many of them are just made up. Okay. The climate thing and the carbon, the carbon footprint stuff is completely made up. Uh, their whole thing is that you can buy carbon offsets. There'll be carbon trading and, you know, you'll, you're going to get a carbon score, not only for you, but all your suppliers and their suppliers. And it's called uh, scope three which let me just take a minute to say, Andrew, that hmm. right now in the United States, every public company is paying on average $2 billion a year for compliance. Right now, every public company in the United States is paying $2 billion, $2 billion a year for compliance. And the SEC commissioner has recently said that with full scope three ESG compliance, that will go to eight billion dollars per company per company so four times so six billion dollars per company times the number of companies on the exchanges is going to get thrown at consultants and highly paid diversity officers to check boxes and this is and not is, is there help, this does not help ceos run their companies or yeah. or make their industries more efficient is there any research that you've seen that could help us understand that cost just so that we can verify it? You know, obviously scientific method uh, and also an SEC statement. it's an SEC statement. So I've got it actually on the blog Yep. and you can trace, you, I have no idea how the chairman of the SEC came up with this. I'm sure he's got yep. some resources. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that and we'll include that in our show notes. Cause yeah. I want our show notes to be yeah. some resources that people can go to. Yeah. So I've asked you, what are the problems? And one so, of the things okay. you've said is that the problems, some of them are made up. Some of them are made up. Yep. Right. And some, some, some of the solutions example, to them are, you know, that's a separate thing where you talked about carbon credits and offsets and stuff, which you could argue is is a solution. But let, let's just talk about like real versus, you know, made up yeah. problems. What are these problems that we're trying to solve? Uh, I don't have a long list, but I'll give yep. you a really good example. Human trafficking is bad, right? Yep. I think we can all agree that we don't want companies using slave labor or forcing people to work for them. There are many examples of this, right? There are many examples of U.S. companies using contractors in other countries 
where they have suicide nets at the bottom of the buildings because mm. people jump out the windows, where they have looked the other way to, to you know, take advantage of cheap labor in camps that you don't want a film crew to go see mm. and, and on and on. And this is bad, right? So, so we sh that, that it's very important that this come out. And it's very important that we have transparency. What's not okay is to reduce it to a score that some consultant gives you. This is just like uh, an IQ score. It's a very multidimensional problem and it needs multidimensional, you know, investigative reporting. Okay. So let's, let's, right? let's talk about that for a second. So it sounds like um, after listening to what you're talking about, it sounds like you're one of your biggest uh, points that you're making is that the use of a score, maybe for anything, you know, for I guess anything. you could also say, you know, the only way we look at children is their GPA. That's insane. Right. Okay. So my, my, my kids go to a school where there are no grades and no tests. That's very much on purpose. That's insane for sure. Okay. So let's just talk about, let's talk about GPA for a second, because that's a score. Yeah. And let's talk about why using GPA. I mean, because that's an accepted thing. Everybody follows it. Everybody does it. Why would, what would be the downside of using a score that's yeah. a pretty comprehensive score? You don't have any other scores out of, out of university, really. Or it's, out an of high indicator, school. it's an indicator of obedience. Sure. So in the factory era, that was a really good indicator of success. Because mm. you you do what your superiors said, and that's what that's what the whole institution was about. Now you probably noticed AI is going to take the repetitive work away, yep. right? So over the next fifty years, AI will replace all repetitive jobs, right? So we we need people who are independent thinkers, who are creative, who are going to spend ninety nine percent of the learning outside of school. So this concept of schooling people up for four years and then unleashing them and then that they're good for the next 60 years, that's that was over a long time ago. So it has been failing for a long time. Okay, and so let's just let's, see let's just number... let's let's go to this for just a second because I agree sure. that when we think about GPA, there are some people, young people, teachers, parents that obsessively focus on that GPA. And they become almost robots. And as I've oftentimes said to my university students, that um, sometimes the highest grade people end up having the hardest time in the real world. So I definitely can understand that an obsession with it is bad. But, you know, there's plenty of normal people that have, you know, got some independent thinking from school and still got high GPA and all that why let's talk a little bit more about the damage that it's doing is the damage that gpa does so significant that it offsets the good that gpa does because i feel like that's also what's happening with esg like come on this you know this is good so let's just We're think of gpa here. because everybody right. understands that as a sec for a second i've done a really thorough teardown of uh, education <laughs> and of especially secondary education which is four years that that you're never going to get back and that is really not going to serve you in to, in the 21st century not sure that it did anything for anybody in the 20th century it's just a signal it's really just a signal to employers right employers can say oh high gpa from harvard no problem you know that's a, that's an easy one right so it's just outsourcing their their hiring uh, decisions but if you didn't go for four years and you just went into the job pool and started working how far would you be in four years and how in debt would you be mm. uh i would say and you, we never get to see the counterfactual you know we see oh well he went and got good grades and then he got a big job at some big consulting firm or you know went to some and it's been fantastic for him yeah but could he have done or she have done better with four years of real world experience, getting paid, not going into debt and not paying attention to fake signaling, but actually getting re getting kicked in the pants in the business world. I, you know, instead, because in, in school, you know, oh, OK, I got to see in that. All right, whatever. I'm moving on. It, it, that doesn't happen in the real world. There are no grades in the real world. Nobody gets a grade. You get like you get your head handed to you if you screw up or 
you have a bad boss or things happen and you move on to the next thing, but you carry it with you the whole way. Okay, so some right? of the argument here is that um, life is complex, the problems we face are complex, humans are yes. complex, and narrowing yes. it down to one indicator as in GPA, just, you know, it, it may have some good points, it may have some, you know, um, benefits for some people, but the overall point is, is that it misses the full development of a human or it misses the opportunity to have a passion for learning or creating an environment that's, you know, bringing out the best potential in people or what? Couple things. First of all, is it relevant? Mm -hmm. Or is the MBA relevant? I argue it isn't. When I was a candidate to be the dean of a business school, I said, let's get rid of business of deans and let's let's, let's do it a different way yep. because the MBA is just a single. First of all, let's let's just cover this. It's not the MBA, it's not the GPA that matters. It's the name of your school. Right. Period. That's 99% of it. The GPA is secondary. Oh, you went to Yale too. Oh my gosh, do you know Professor What's his name? You know, it's really about did you go to an Ivy League, Ivy League school or a top 10% school? That matters much more than the degree. Mm -hmm. Second, people asked, would you go to Harvard Business School for two years for free, no charge, take all the tests, get everything, get the grade, everything. The only thing you don't get at the end of those two years is the certificate. Or you can pay $80,000 a year for two years and get the certificate. No one has any interest in the education. Mm. No one, nobody goes for that. It's available. You can audit any class at MIT you want. It's, right. They're not going to stand in your way. You can take the courses, you can get the knowledge, but you pay for the signal. And that's, and that's really what's broken is on the hiring side that mm. they think this is important. It is, and, and Elon Musk has said so, and a bunch of companies have come out and said, we're not going to pay attention to that stuff anymore. That's nonsense. Right. And it's the same thing with so many other areas of life, Andrew. There's a there's a score on a bottle of wine you've probably seen from Robert Parker, right? Robert Parker can't even rescore the same bottle two years later, anywhere close to the name number he gave it two years earlier. He has no idea. It's arbitrary. Okay, so let's let's now move back to ESG. So what we've tried to yeah. do in this discussion is. Uh, try to narrow down some of your arguments. And I think one of the arguments, which I think has some strong validity, is that coming up with one score um, on something or even scoring things is full of problems, full of bad incentives, full of um, you know uh, subjectiveness, possibly in the process, full of obedience and you know all of that. Uh, Fantastic so, money maker. Yep. and or yeah scorer. yep. Okay. Industry. So now, now let's, let's, let's go let's back to then. For a second. I want to What's look that? at countries because countries are getting ESG scores, right? Two countries with the highest ESG scores in the world are Sri Lanka and Ghana, both of which recently in the last year imploded financially, mm. economically. Um, much of it as a result of failed policies, ass kissing, to get the ESG scores so they could get the loans from the World Bank to develop according to ESG principles that don't work, that drive energy prices through the roof, that make unreliable you know, power and energy, and that hurt the poor with energy poverty like crazy. And so all the countries are now getting the ESG scores. So countries are getting ranked cities and states in the United States are being ranked and, and governors are, uh, are getting very upset. I've got several articles in my blog about governors saying, you know, now, now my state is on a list that tells lenders what risk I have because I'm an ESG risk, because, mm. I, because I'm not at the top of the ESG rankings. And so I can't borrow, I can't, my state can't even lend to oil producers in my own state. You know, we can't even do bond issues and, and conduct pr and finance programs because no banks will lend to us because we're not, uh, we don't have the right score. Right. 
Okay, so let's, let me ask you. Let me ask you a question then about this. Um, one, is it, you know, there's a lot of people that just mindlessly kind of follow what they've learned, and you know, there's plenty of parents that say, you know, I'm just going to focus on the GPA. You know, get your shit together, get your GPA up, right? Uh, yeah. Schools are yeah. focusing on it. People are focusing on it. So there's a certain amount of, I I would say, acceptance that we just don't have a better way. And therefore, let's just use this and we need to make progress. So let's focus on a score. And then there's yeah. other people who know, who really, truly understand the deviousness of the scoring system. And they are big thinkers who can see the incentive systems. As Charlie Munger said, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. Right. They're That's seeing right. that bigger picture of where this right. leads. So is the ESG movement just a lot of followers following along and saying, hey, look, this is the best that we can do right now. You know, we don't have a replacement for G GPA. And therefore, this is the best we can do. Let's do it. Or is it people that are nefariously behind the scenes seeing that this is a, a fascinating way to get things to go a particular direction? Yes, this is a snow job that has become an industry and that people's you know, livelihood depend on them not knowing that it's wrong, right? It, they're dependent on, I mean, it, it's a $2 trillion industry, Andrew. It is, it is in, it's the enfranchised, it's, it's going great mm -hmm. from their point of view. My God, they're completely in control. No one can dissent. <laughs> no CEO of any public company can say, this is nonsense. The emperor has no clothes. So it's been adopted Not by every company. Possible. It's been adopted by uh, states and cities and countries. It's being adopted by the regulator. Being forced. Right. On them. So, so why, you know, are people that stupid that uh, everybody's going to adopt it and then you're saying that it's wrong? Come on. Sure. Social signaling, follow the money, follow the money. It's it's a it's driven by the the ratings agencies at the, the companies that do the rating, so that and and that and it feeds in tandem with the asset allocators, the Black Rocks, to say we've got a net zero index, and if you don't conform, you're out of the index. And out of the index versus in the index probably is a difference of 10% in your stock price. Right. right? So, and, so it's and consistent holding, harassment you know, that you're hostage. out of the index. You're just holding CEOs hostage. You're okay, not pursuing so, so, access. So is your, you're pursuing is your, ass kissing. So your, your argument would then be that there's people behind the scenes that are running this type of stuff that really see how the incentive system works because maybe they feel like right like this is uh this is this is our our way of achieving our climate goals or our environment goals or our social goals so this is a good right thing or do they really have some crafty ideas behind it i think it's al gore is a kind of a good analogy you know it just works for him Right. Why would he you know what they've done very well is they've come up with a slew of names to call the people that they disagree with. They never engage in any debate or discussion. And the U.N. has already said there is no debate. There's no reason for, for any debate on this. It's done. The science is settled and we own the science. Hmm. So there's no talking about it. Anybody who disagrees with us is wrong. And how many times have you seen that if you're a student of failure from you know, Ignaz Semmelweis and the germ theory to uh, eugenics to McCarthyism. I mean, it just, it goes on and on. It never stops. And if you don't have critical thinkers and independent people and open markets who can make their own decisions, then everything just falls into groupthink and nobody has to think anymore. Yep. Okay, and it's so how do you. Phenomenally profitable. How much money has Al Gore? He's monetized his scare story into getting a a Nobel Prize, building a media company. I mean, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. And ask Deloitte. I've given speeches to some of these big, you know, uh, consulting, big four consulting firms. 
and they can't this is where this is bread and butter are you kidding this is no they can't talk you can't talk about it that's the yeah, That's I definitely, so I can definitely see that it's very difficult for people to go against this or to question That's the it. Sign of fascism. That is the sign of fascism. I was kicked out of LinkedIn two weeks ago because I launched my site. I want you know you'll you'll tell people, but it's cuttingthroughthenoise.net. Mm. And I'm I'm tell me where I'm wrong, I'll fix it. But my message is things are pretty fucked up, and. LinkedIn's message is you're out. Mm. We don't want mm. you on the platform. So I think I would like to wrap this up by going to the um let's let's make a vision of hope for the young person who does have a critical yeah. mind. Yep, go ahead. I need to do one more thing before I need to take us down into the whole one okay, level. Okay, let's go one more level okay. deeper. Because it's going to go from state and city level to personal ESG score. And if you think I'm not kidding, fall asleep for 10 years and wake up. It's going to be it's going to be right here. Front mm. and center it's going to be your personal social credit score just like we have in China. You're going to get ID'd everywhere, your footprint, how many miles you've traveled, how many carbon, you know, grams of carbon, how much air travel all of this stuff is going to determine your credit, your ability to whether you can travel again. Or if you forgot something at the golf club, can you drive back across town to mm. get it or not? That's all going to be determined by an app that is going to be watching you 24 seven and your insurance rates and your uh, credit will all be determined. I, I really hate, it sounds just like insane, right? But mm. it's just, it's just a slippery slope and i'm yeah sure i'm a bit of an anarchist but i also think there's rule there's a reasonable role for government but this is the direction we're going and i would say you know i i liken it to uh to when they say we have nine years left to save the planet you know which everybody says right i think we have about nine years left until this esg fascism just takes over completely simply by virtue of the fact that it's not okay to talk about mm. that's it's silence is their weapon so with that i guess that would be a bad sign if you were a psychologist and you were talking doing family therapy with a family and people describe that it's not okay to question dad as an example then Look we at would the say behind you book behind you on your shelf by Hans Rosling called Factfulness. Yes. You know, you're familiar with the book. Yep. Amazing book. I want everybody to read Factfulness, but there's one chapter on climate change that is absolute statistical nonsense mm. that practically was dictated by Al Gore. Right. It's just, it's not true. Right. So if it's going to be that hard that Hans Rosling, rest in peace, we love Hans Rosling, moment of silence. If, you know, for guys like Rosling and for critical thinkers not to dive in deep enough to really understand it, what chances do we have for the rest of the world? You know, energy, so, you know, there's like Alex Epstein said, there's there's six and a half billion people on the earth who can't afford energy very well right now. Mm -hmm. And things are getting much worse for them and they're getting hurt and and they're dying because they can't afford the energy they need because right. of failed policies in the last 20 years. So let's now focus on okay. That's a doom and gloom. Yep. And and I I can see uh there's all kinds of reasons why a credit score makes sense to businesses and they want they want this and governments are going to go along with it because, you know, they see a lot of benefit in having all that information. The only person that's going to be boxed in is the individual, but you know, individual doesn't matter that much probably to many of these guys. They want the bigger picture. <clears throat> Um, so my question is, <clears throat> for an independent thinker, which you've already told us, like Hans, as you mentioned, and other really strong independent thinkers, it's been amazing, particularly during the pandemic time, to watch yeah. independent thinkers' minds explode. Like they really, <laughs> they can think independently about a particular thing, but when it goes to something else that somehow they have an emotional attachment, it's very difficult. Um 
for them to change right. their thinking on it. It's difficult for me, you know? Right. <clears throat> and I want you to help myself and my listeners and viewers to, to you know, what are the steps to independent thinking so that we can combat this in at an individual level and 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 participate where it makes sense and not participate where it doesn't make sense. So tell us about critical thinking a little bit and how we can become better at it. So I, I my kids go to the school and I'm I'm not on the board but I'm an advisor. It's called so the Socratic Experience SocraticExperience.com. I want or dot edge no it's dot com. I want people to see it because there are no grades at that school and there there are no tests. And they just want people to become critical thinkers. And I say, the goal of, of all of this is to know when to go with the herd and when to go against. And, and if you think about things like conspiracy theory, there are no conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theory is a word that tries to lump people together who think that they're, all of them think that nobody ever walked on the moon and the earth is flat and there's COVID is, it, you know, the, the, that Bill Gates wants to put a chip in your, you know, all this stuff that's just all, that's ridiculous. You have to take everything one thing at a time <clears> on its own merit. So I've written a big essay on this. It's called uh, inreality.show, inreality.show. It's a huge essay, thousand, ten, hundred thousand people have read it. Mm. And it's just one thing at a time. What do we know? What are the papers? What's the research? What are the, what's the balance, right? And these are the muscles you have to develop. And I have a list of books for being able to do that. This is basically called Bayesian reasoning. Mm. I have videos on this on YouTube. Type in David Siegel Bayesian. You'll find a bunch of videos on this. They're phenomenal people. I have a book list at my consulting site, which is infinitegameoflife.com. Mm. And there I have videos and books and how decision science you got to learn this stuff. So you were asking before about an 18 year old. What would I recommend an 18 year old do? Yep. Stop listening to your parents. You know, if you got into MIT and your goal is to get a PhD. OK, fine. You're in the 0.0001% and you're going to get an MIT and a PhD in, in astrophysics. Great. All right. Everybody else, <clears throat> don't do it. You know, do not go to some second or third tier college. It isn't going to help. Do not go for the grades. Get out into the working world because you're going to spend 99% of all your learning is going to happen after education. You're going to have to learn to work and learn your entire life. In okay, case you David. haven't noticed, AI and robots are coming David, we're screwed. All your we're screwed because no, this not. is just no, too much work. It's too much work for the no, average person. You can do it. No, this is awesome. We can do it. It's just that we are not going to do the repetitive work. Machines are going to do the repetitive work. Machines, but I'm, what I'm you know, saying, what I'm saying, I mean, one of the biggest challenges that I face in, you know, the 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 mental and emotional energy in questioning your own reasoning, like this morning, I was listening to a podcast of a guy that had an absolutely opposite opinion, and I tried to listen to podcast. It's hard. It's yeah, hard. Right. It's. Right. I mean, I have some political podcasts I listen to for the purpose of listening right to it but it's hard yeah a uh, really good book the art of insubordination by todd cash dan phenomenal book another book called cascades by uh greg Sattel. there's several books on and then uh and then how uh Mc, mclean oh what's his name uh phenomenal book on how uh how to change people's minds mm. by uh, it's phenomenal. And it's really about tactical empathy, about listening, about not uh, uh, not uh, um, um, separating yourself, you know, making bonds with people, mm. uh, not being antagonistic and getting group momentum and doing it more from within. And this is stuff we all have to learn. So I'm getting a group of people to destroy the ESGs and we're just not going to do it with confrontation. We're going to mm. do it through, you know, clear, principled, open eyed arguments and understanding so, where people are coming from and try to try to move them one step at a time. It's the only it's the only way anybody's going to do anything. So one of the things I do in my valuation masterclass boot camp where I train young people 
how to value companies and in you know ultimately invest. And one of the beautiful things about the stock market is that it is punishing. It is ruthless. It is yeah. unforgiving. Yeah. If you go yeah. into the stock market with no knowledge and we we take out the factor of luck, some people are going to go into the stock market with no knowledge and they're going to get yeah. rich through luck. But if we yeah. take out the yeah. factor of luck, you're basically going to get creamed. And, right. and, and as long as that, now that's not ultimately, I think people want to destroy that even by the Fed and other ways that we can manipulate it so that we don't have to suffer the consequences. But for right now, I would say that generally it forces truth to a certain extent. And so I try to teach the students that to understand the market and understand that. And then I tell them, believe nothing, believe no one demand evidence. And therefore, they're not going to invest in something that they haven't questioned. And my objective for them is to question the different theories on why a particular stock is a buy and why a particular stock is a sell, and then use the tools that they've gotten through CFA, through my course, through other places where they can get those tools and then apply them. But if you don't have independent thinking and you're not questioning everything, then you run into the risk that you just follow along. So I'm doing my little part with a small group of students in the Valuation Masterclass Bootcamp. But I just think that my answer to the question that I asked you is how do we help a young person? I would say, question everything. You don't have to do anything the way anybody tells you to. Richard Feynman says, you know, go learn in the most irreverent way possible, whatever, whatever you want in the most irreverent way possible. Um, All right. Let's let, I love, you know, Richard Feynman was uh, fantastic. And for those that don't know him, he was a famous physicist, I believe started at Cornell and then went to, um, to uh, Caltech. Uh, he started I, at MIT, then Cornell, yep. then back to MIT. Then, then he was at Princeton for a little while. And then, then the, uh, the Manhattan Project, and yep. then spent his rest of his years at Caltech. Yeah, you couldn't um, you couldn't do wrong said, by reading every book that he's written, watching every video I, of him. He's an amazing guy. I read everything, and I watch all the videos to my kids. And, yeah. and he said, he said, uh, be careful. Um, you first must not fool yourself because you are the easiest <laughs> person to fool. If you think you can consistently beat the market. Um, after reading everything Eugene Fama has written and taking yeah, into yeah. consideration that there are hedge fund guys who are trying to take your money every day, um, then then you've got to realize, you know, after reading Nassim Taleb, that whenever mm -hmm. you have a win, uh, there's a huge luck component there. Yeah, and it's yeah. very hard to beat the indexes. And so a smart portfolio of index-like things is very difficult to beat. So last question, what is your number one goal for the next 12 months? No, I really would like to build this thing. It's cutting through the noise.net. Here's my thesis. Look, if if companies are spending $2 billion on ESG compliance and they're looking at $8 billion, this is real money. Uh, why don't they give me $1 million each and give me the resources I need to not, not kill the ESGs, just build a better alternative so everyone can say, look, we have a better thing than that. that that's ridiculous. Let's go to this framework over here. Um, that's what I would like to build. And I'd like to have that really in motion by the end of the year. Great. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another discussion about losses, about winning, about thinking. Remember, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people to reduce risk in their lives. If you haven't yet joined the mission, just go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now and become a member. Get my Become a Better Investor newsletter to reduce risk in your life. As we conclude, David, I want to thank you again for rejoining our mission and our show. And on behalf of A Stotts Academy, I'm not going to award you status. I'm not going to award you alumni status because you already have it. But I'm going to thank you for joining the mission. Do you have any parting words for our audience? Uh, do I get a mug? <laughs> yeah which do, do you do you have swag <laughs> <laughs>
No, no, really uh, develop yourself and learn all you can. Podcasts like this are really valuable. There's plenty of other good ones. Don't take anything from other people and find your own way. Look at the data, learn to interpret data and learn to ask nasty, difficult, irritating questions. Great. And that's a wrap on another great episode and story to help us to create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today we added one more person down on our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.